Hey guys, I am so excited to bring you Dr. Jamie Seaman, aka Dr. Fit and Fabulous, if you're on Instagram. Um, Dr. Dr. Seaman has become a very popular resource on Instagram in the keto community. She's a board certified OB, and she's also had an amazing transformation herself um, with the ketogenic diet, and she just has a great approach. She's so knowledgeable on hormones and the things that are um, going on inside our body when we match them with a ketogenic diet, and it's been really cool to see her stand up as a medical professional and say, hey, let's fix these things on the front end instead of medicating from the back end. So um, she just has a wonderful way of communicating her, communicating her message. So I hope you guys enjoy this episode from Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hey guys, I have Dr. Fit and Fabulous on the other line here, and she actually has a name and it's Jamie. <laughs> and if you guys don't follow her on Instagram, you need to like venture over there right now and follow Dr. Fit and Fabulous. Um, we connected through Instagram. Gosh, Jamie, what was it like maybe six or seven months ago? Something yeah, like that. I think so. Yeah. And I got so excited because you were like, Hey, so I'm going through this keto journey and I can actually run blood tests on myself. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, Oh my gosh. Yes. Like experiment everything. Tell me what happens. So can you, let's first have you introduce yourself. What kind of a doctor you are besides fit and fabulous. And, uh, let's start with your journey in keto and then maybe venture into like what you've experimented with and geek out on that. Yes. So my name is Dr. Jamie Seaman, and I'm a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist. And I practice um, in private practice here in Omaha, Nebraska. But I'm also a fellow in integrative medicine. So I have a very preventative based approach to my practice. Um, but the ketogenic space is interesting. I have a background in nutrition, I'm a former collegiate athlete. And, you know, going into medical school, they really didn't teach you a lot about nutrition. So a lot of my nutrition knowledge came from my undergraduate training in exercise science and nutrition. Oh, and cool. I always say I'm just as human as my patients. So when I went to medical school, I had my first baby. So I experienced my, my first pregnancy. And it was in my first pregnancy that I failed my glucose testing. <laughs> And, uh, and then, um, and then I went on to have two subsequent pregnancies. So I have three daughters and I failed my glucose testing in every single pregnancy. <laughs> can you, can you elaborate for maybe guys who are listening or people who don't know what you're talking about there? Yes. So pregnancy is actually kind of a diabetogenic state. So during pregnancy, the placenta, um, secretes a few different hormones um, that actually increase insulin resistance. And part of this is so that the growing fetus can get all the nutrients and nourishment that they need. And so the problem is that if a woman has baseline insulin resistance, pregnancy can kind of be a tipping point into gestational mm -hmm. diabetes. And people who get gestational diabetes have a 50% increased risk of, of lifetime risk of developing type two diabetes. And wow. so the, the issue is that pregnancy is, I say the, the greatest physiologic test of a woman's lifetime. So we see patients that develop hypertension, diabetes for the first time ever in their pregnancies. And sometimes this can be a window into your future health. And so, um, for me, you know, failing these glucose tests was a little bit discouraging because if anybody would have looked at me from the outside, I, you know, thought I was eating pretty healthy and I was exercising at the gym and I, I, I was not obese. And after my first daughter was born, I developed hypothyroidism. Mm -hmm. And then after my, my third pregnancy, finally, I went to an annual exam and I said, you know, I have a family history of diabetes and I'm, you know, kind of upset that I failed these glucose tests and maybe we should draw some labs. And, um, I found out that I had pre-diabetes. And so this was like a really wow. eye-opening experience for somebody who, you know, is in their early thirties and works out. And I mean, I thought I was right. taking pretty good care of myself and, um, I could just see the writing on the wall. So it really started on a personal level for me. You know, I thought, gosh, you have a degree in nutrition and exercise science. You have a medical <laughs> degree. Like, why can't you figure this out? And, you know, the, you know, the recommendation was here, just like take this thyroid medicine and, you know, try to get all your baby weight off. And so I, I kind of went on this mission to get back to my pre-pregnancy weight. And 
I experimented with lots of different ways of eating. I tried Whole30 and then that kind of transitioned into a paleo lifestyle. And then it was, you know, probably um, nine to 12 months after my daughter was born that I thought, you know, we should really try keto. I grew up um, with a mom who struggled with her weight her whole life. And I always kind of remembered that when she would cut carbs, she always used to lose weight like a little bit easier. And so I Mm -hmm. thought, well, I, I have the same genes as my parents. And so I really started to cut carbohydrates and the weight just seemed to come off easier. I was feeling really good. Um, I had better energy. You know, I thought it was normal to just be asleep on the couch at eight o'clock at night when you have three kids and a busy Uh job. And um, I just noticed that I just, I felt better. Like it wasn't just that the weight was coming off. I just felt like my health in general was more optimized. And you know, the cool part about being a doctor is I have easy access to to testing. And so I've, you know, I've tested my thyroid function and my my glucose and my insulin and my lipids and lots of other markers kind of through this journey. But this has been um, now about a two and a half year journey. And last year, actually, I think, you know, when we met Tara was when I was deciding that I was going to try a month of carnivore. I think that's actually yeah. the first for like, yeah. Hey, yeah, well, yeah. What's what's with this? Like, tell me, like, what you're following. So, I think in November was when I did 30 days of carnivore just to like see what it would do. You know, really cutting carbs even more. And and now I've kind of settled on what I would call like keto carnivore. So I eat predominantly um, animal based foods with small amounts of plants, and I'm at the best body composition I've ever been. My biomarkers are the best they've ever been, and. I've really taken a completely different approach in my medical practice now, you know, with people because medicine is not doing a lot of people justice when it comes to chronic diseases. You know, we're just seeing a, an increase in, in chronic diseases and the standard American diet for most people is is not the answer. It's failing a lot of people. And so for me, nutrition is basically the number one treatment approach for a lot of you know, problems that patients come in complaining about. And I feel so great doing it that I feel like, you know, I'm just trying to be an example for my patients. I say, you know, walk the walk, talk the talk. And I, I, uh, I shouldn't ask them to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I love that. And I just have to say, because like, (laughs) you can't say it. But if you guys haven't seen uh, Dr. Jamie here, like I know <laughs> you look absolutely incredible. Um, your skin is glowing. You're like totally jacked. <laughs> and, um, I think that like when you show up like that, you know, like people really listen, like you're like, Hey, listen, like this is what's up. This is what's working. And then you have the medical knowledge to back that up. It's, it's, it's so beautiful because you're, you're walking the walk and not just talking the talk. And I know that that's impacting your clients or your patients. Sorry. Um, but let's back up a little bit. Okay. So when did you, like when you started doing blood tests, like were you keto yet or just low carb or when did you kind of start experimenting on yourself with the blood? So, well, I found out I had hypothyroidism and prediabetes. And when I uh-huh. kind of trying all these different diets, I, I really wasn't following any blood work. I was literally just following a scale. Like I had just had this uh-huh. number in my head and I wanted to lose like 40 pounds because that was going to get me back to my pre-pregnancy weight. And so I was really just obsessed with like the number on the scale. Uh-huh. And um, I, you know, I got to that weight and, but then I was like, okay, well, I don't really like feel that great, right? The weight's off, but I'm like tired and I mm. still have low thyroid function. And, mm. and so It was when I started keto, like a month, maybe a month in, I was like, you know, I'm going to get some baseline lab work and I'm going to follow this. And um, even just getting some of the weight off, you know, my hemoglobin A1C came down a little bit. My thyroid function um, actually improved a little bit too, but I've been following like every maybe, you know, six months drawing labs to kind of see what's happening inside my body because clearly we can't make assumptions from the outside what's really going Mm -hmm. on, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, so, all right. So what, what, tell us how the numbers went roughly. Yeah. So my hemoglobin A1C, we know is pretty much close to 6.5 when I started. And then as I, as I lost some of the weight, you know, it, it came down closer to six. And then now that I've been ketogenic, um, it's really like at a 4.9. 
Um, the other thing I've been following is, you know, fasting insulin levels. And so it's been interesting to watch my fasting insulin come down. It was like, oh. um, I think when I started keto, my fasting insulin was like around 16, 17. And then I kind of watched it come down into the like six and seven range. And it really wasn't until wow. I went more carnivore that I could actually even get it below five. And then wow. I did yeah. kind of an interesting experiment in January. Um, I had um, a friend suggests um, carb cycling and I was like, okay, I'm going to try this. So basically what I did was like mostly kind of keto carnivore for six days. Um, but I actually kept it lower fat. So it was almost similar to like a protein sparing modified fast where we basically, mm -hmm. you know, keep protein at a certain threshold and then, and drop both the fat and the carbs kind of lower. And it was, I was really just trying to see, you know, what I could do on a body composition level Mm -hmm. Well, what I found out was on the days that I did these really large carb refeeds, um, well, number one, I felt awful. Um, <laughs> and I think we have, you know, some explanation for that. The, the problem was, is some of the carbs, because of the high carbohydrate intake that I needed on those days, I was adding some things that contained sucrose and fructose. Um, we also know that people who are ketogenic for a long time can sometimes have down regulation of GLUT4 transporters. And so... Sometimes even biochemically, it can look like insulin resistance is coming back. So the interesting part is after I did these carb refeeds, I checked my insulin resistance score and I had insulin resistance again. And oh, so, yeah. You know, cool. Just, this is awesome. And can you explain what GLUT4 transporters are real quick? For yeah. People? And so, so, so we have these different transporters in our cells that basically shuttle things like glucose and ketones in and out of the cells. And so... Um, basically when you consume certain things, your body lays down a cellular network to make your body run more efficiently. So for instance, when we talk about this idea of like keto adaptation, you're actually laying down, um, more, um, like glute one transporters and transporters that shuttle ketones in and out. And so glucose has the same thing. It has these transporters. And so as you use glucose less and less, you know, as a primary fuel source, you can have down regulation of these receptors. And so um, I, you know, experimented and, and clearly, you know, I'm somebody that probably, you know, can't like keto adapt and add in like tons of carbs. It's just, it's probably, you know, more on a genetic level for me. And it, and it is, I've actually done some genetic testing and found out I carry a ton of insulin resistance genes. <laughs> right. Um, and so Every patient is not different. And that's why I think it's actually super important for people to kind of self-experiment a little bit and follow some of these markers, you know, with your provider, whether it's like a functional medicine doctor, you know, or your own physician, but everybody is not created equally. We all, you know, have different genetics and epigenetics and the way we, re we respond to things. And unfortunately, I'm just one of those people that, um, that low carb is, is what works best for me. Yeah, so cool. Um, did you also test your thyroid over this whole journey? Like, how did your thyroid go? Yeah, so super interesting. When I was diagnosed with hypothyroidism, I had very classic hypothyroidism symptoms. I was like fatigued, constipation, and um, changes on like hair, and I just felt so sluggish. And I could literally like tell my doctor when my thyroid stimulating hormone, my TSH, was above one. Like I just seemed to feel the best when my TSH was at a one. And then when I lost the weight and, um, went keto, my TSH did go up, um, slightly, but I didn't have any symptoms at all. Now we know that when people calorie restrict, um, that we, we will see a drop in thyroid function. So just dieting in general will cause a, a reduction in the free T3 hormone and, and subsequently sometimes a rise in the TSH or the thyroid stimulating hormone. So TSH tells your thyroid gland that you need more thyroid and it should put out more thyroid. So when it's low, it's, it's, it's a feedback loop essentially. And so I did see the TSH go up, but at that time, my doctor, you know, traditional physician was, was only checking free T4 and TSH. So when I went ketogenic um, and I was, you know, checking my own labs, I was following my, my free T3 levels, which is the active thyroid right. hormone in the body. And what I've found is that being keto um, and now carnivore, my TSH will be anywhere between one and three, essentially. But I've had normal um, free T3 and free T4 numbers 
um, the entire time. So I haven't had any reduction in thyroid function. It's completely normal. I'm off of all thyroid replacement now. Um, and I feel really good. So what's funny is like back in the day, if my TSH was 2.5, I would have felt awful. It'd be interesting to know what my T3 was back then, but um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some, you know, controversy, like what should the TSH be, but, but free T3 is the, uh, the active thyroid hormone in the body. And so you want to make sure you're looking at all of the different numbers when you're looking at that. Yeah, for sure. Okay, cool. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, I'm having a lot of success with my thyroid clients with keto right now, you know, and it goes a little bit against traditional advice. You know, a lot of what you're taught is like, oh, if you have thyroid issues, you definitely need carbs. And, and you know, kind of I've gotten to this place where it's like, well, not if you have glucose homeostasis issues, you know, not necessarily. So I think that's, that's really cool. I hope that's helpful for some people to hear your like journey on the blood work. Um, I'm curious. Well, too, like, Tara is like, so it kind of depends like why you have hypothyroidism. So for people like with Hashimoto's, which is essentially like an autoimmune condition, you know, if that's driven by inflammation in the body, sometimes just correct, you know, correcting the inflammatory, right. you know, whatever's inciting that inflammation, a lot of times will correct thyroid dysfunction. Yeah. Beautiful point. So true. Okay. So now like, are you still, you're still doing like this keto, keto carnivore approach? Yeah. Yeah. I am. And, and you went like totally carnivore for a while, right? Yeah. I went, um, we, when we first started, we're like, Let's yeah. just go. you know, it's funny. It's like, it's such a journey. Cause when I first started hearing about, you know, people doing carnivore, I was like, that is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And, um, and then I thought, okay, I mean, I get it. It kind of makes sense. But right. Even as a physician, we have this like beat into our heads, like eat your fruit and vegetables, eat your fruit and vegetables. So I really started to like dive into the science of like, what would be the reason to eliminate, you know, so much, so many plant foods. And then I thought, well, you know, let's just try it for 30 days and let's see what happens with my labs and let's see how I feel. And let's see what happens to my body composition. And so we tried it for 30 days in November and uh, my husband and I both, and we dropped like a significant amount of body fat. I, I do admit the very first week that I did it, I was probably under eating a little bit because meat is like so satiating. Right. I was like, okay, and I'm it's not, not like you wake up and you're like, mm, I can't wait to have some fish eggs and meat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I can't eat another bite of steak. So, um, but honestly, like towards the end of the month, I just kind of got bored, I guess, with like the texture. Mm -hmm. So it was really mostly mm -hmm. out of boredom that I was like, okay, I really kind of want a salad or I want to like some veggies. And it right. was really mostly texture, but honestly, I felt really, really good. And then as I started to add more carbs in, like I would notice that I would feel more bloated and um, I just didn't feel as great. So right now I just do like really small amounts of plant food, you know, like I really love avocados. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe some leafy greens here and there or some nuts and seeds. But my my predominant meal is is mostly carnivore. And part of the reason that I find a lot of success this way is because I find that a lot of women under consume protein. Mm -hmm. And so my kind of motto when I'm working with clients is I say, number one, prioritize protein. So like every meal, snack, where is your protein? Because uh -huh. the problem that a lot of people, you know, find when they go keto is that they just try to take all their bad habits from their standard American diet. And <laughs> yeah. To, I call keto fi them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So a lot of keto fi versions of things tend to be just very high in fat and lower in protein. And so I say prioritize protein, fill with fat and count your carbs. And so kind of this keto carnivore approach is what really works best for me because it really prioritizes that protein in my diet. Um, you know, there's certainly some fat and meats and then I'm, you know, adding small amounts of, of veggies and things like that in too, but it's, you know, essentially low or no carb certain days. Yeah, I love it. And, you know, essentially, that's how I eat most days, too. I always prioritize that protein. It really honestly changed my life. And I think like our body types are very similar. And you can <laughs> you can tell that we prioritize protein. Um, It's because, well, honestly, it's pretty amazing how much muscle you can build <laughs> when you're actually eating the protein to support your workouts. Right. Right. So, yeah, I love I love that motto, by the way. That's great. That makes it really simple for people to understand how to improve their body composition on, on a ketogenic diet. Um, and I, well, I love the, 
What I find too is that, you know, I think that ketogenic gets this reputation of low carb, high fat. And there are certain people like, for instance, postmenopausal women that just tend to do better with like more moderate fat. And so I think sometimes people just get it so, so stuck in their heads that they need like add fat to everything, more fat. This is high fat. It's the fat that like puts me into ketosis. And for some people that's, um, that's not going to get them the results that they're really looking for. Oh, I love that insight. Yeah, let's dive into that a little bit since you are an OBGYN. Um, the hormone <laughs> issue, especially for women on keto is obviously like everyone wants answers. Like what have you found on a horm- hormonal perspective? Have you had any, you know, aha moments that you think would be helpful for women to understand like how their hormones are affected from keto? Uh, well, here's the interesting part is like when you look at nutrition and exercise research, you know, related even to hormones, um, nobody wants to study women. (laughs) We are like this really complex biological Mm -hmm. being. And like I said earlier, no one approach is great for everybody, you know, Mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to hormones and how your body might respond to, you know, a certain way of living. Um, I wish I would have tested my hormones like way back in the beginning of my journey, but I, I really didn't. I just recently started testing them. Um, before I got pregnant with my first daughter, I was told by my physician that I had PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, which, you know, really it's a horrible name for, for the disease, but essentially is a a state of insulin resistance. And so, um, I I wouldn't be surprised if, if that's what I really had, but, um, since I've been um, keto and carnivore, um, I've had very regular menstrual cycles. And I think women should understand that their menstrual cycle is, is, is a vital sign. Um, if you're not having regular menstrual cycles, there is some sort of dysregulation that's happening. So we use that as kind of a, a first screening tool of, you know, what's going on with hormones. Um, the other thing people need to understand is our hormones are actually made from cholesterol. So if you're consuming you know, like a whole food plant-based diet that's very low in fat, um, you you could be, you know, doing detriment to your hormones in that regard. Um, Animal-based foods, of course, provide lots of cholesterol for the body. So it's providing those building blocks for for our hormones. Um, I did a podcast, I know, with Paul Saladino. We didn't get too much, you know, into the hormones. So I I would love to talk about that a little bit. So the, the predominant hormone in women is estrogen. And in menstruating women, so women that are actually ovulating, um, they have kind of a cycle of basically estrogen, two weeks of estrogen and and two weeks of progesterone. And then small amounts of of testosterone and DHEA and some of the other androgenic hormones that are predominant in men, but in smaller amounts in women. And there's lots of things that can affect hormone function. So first of all, one thing I deal with in my practice as an OBGYN in women's health is we see a lot of women with what we call estrogen dominance. And this is the category like where PCOS would fall. So they tend to have a lot of estrogen and not much progesterone because the main source of progesterone in women is from ovaries that are actually ovulating. And so if you're not ovulating, Um, you're going to have cycle dysregulation and you're going to have estrogen dominance. So estrogen is made from our ovaries. And then um, we do get some estrogen that's made from our fat cells. So testosterone gets um, converted into estrogen in our fat cells. And so women that can't carry excess adipose tissue um, make lots more estrogen from, from their fat cells. So our fat cells don't just sit there. They're actually an endocrine organ. And the other thing that can also push this pathway more is high insulin. So when I encounter women in my, in my practice who are estrogen dominant or have high insulin or insulin resistance, um, cutting carbohydrates can really correct a lot of their, their hormones. Now, what I found with my own hormone testing is I definitely do not have estrogen dominance. My estrogen um, is kind of on the the lowest end of normal. And then what we care about too with estrogen is how our body is metabolizing and detoxifying our estrogen. So estrogen in the body is essentially a use it and lose it hormone. So we want estrogen, it does lots of amazing things for our body. Um, for our skin, for um, our sexual organs, for our brain, for our heart, for our bones. But once we use the estrogen, we want it to be gone and and it gets excreted um, 
typically through urine and feces and small amounts in bile, and we want it to leave our body. So the other thing that I look at in my practice is, is how good are you at clearing your estrogen and in the, the metabolism of your estrogen, what kind of estrogens do you make? Because estrogen gets broken down in the body into a couple different types of estrogen. And some of those estrogens can cause an increased risk of cancer and in cell prol proliferation. So this is where estrogen gets a, a bad rap for, you know, possibly causing like breast cancer if people you know, have excess estrogen. So we want to be breaking down our estrogen the right way. We want to be excreting our estrogen out of our body the right way. And so these are all, you know, super important things to, to think about and look at. So estrogen dominance is a big one. Um, you know, I've heard out there that like, uh, keto will ruin your hormones. <laughs> um, I uh -huh. found a couple patients low in estrogen and usually in every situation it was due to that their body fat got too low. So we had to start adding in more calories and a little bit more fat to their diet and then it corrected itself. But in these women, it was, they had lost their period. So that was a very clear sign um, because they weren't menstruating that there wasn't enough estrogen to even grow, grow their lining. Um, the other thing that I have found super interesting is I have dealt with acne my my whole life mm -hmm. and your skin is so so good by the way if you guys haven't seen her <laughs> your skin is so like so glowy and clear so that's just crazy well because I don't post pictures when I'm cycle day 21 or 22 <laughs> because every single month um cycle day 21 or 22 I get like these small breakouts and what was interesting is I when I went carnivore it seemed like the month I went carnivore, um, I, I had this breakout during my progesterone phase and I kind of was like, maybe it's from the meat. Like maybe there was extra hormones in the meat and, um, and I'm, and I'm still dealing with it. So I tested my hormone. I, so I went carnivore for a couple of weeks straight and I thought, I'm just going to test my hormones. And I found out that I have, um, so when you break down progesterone in your body, um, you break it down with two enzymes, um, five alpha reductase, and five beta reductase. And I found out that I um, am five alpha reductase dominant, um, which creates metabolites of progesterone and testosterone that are that are more androgenic. And so that's why I probably get that breakout around cycle day 21 or 22. And so what I've done now is um, I've started to add in um, Sol Palmetto, which is a, a dietary um, supplement that you can use that can help block that 5-alpha reductase activity. So, um, so plants aren't all bad. Um, you can use mm -hmm. them, you know, very um, specifically for specific needs in your body. They're not just for everyone. Like we don't just, you know, more isn't better. We just don't throw them all at everybody. But it's been interesting to test my hormones. So now I'm kind of experimenting to see if this will clear up my cycle day 21 acne. <laughs> Oh my gosh. I love that. That's like biohacking at its finest. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah the S that was all so, so helpful. Um, the estrogen dominance thing is really interesting. What was coming to my mind when you were talking about that was, you know, like I used to have the hardest time losing weight, like pretty much my whole life. And I found out from my genetic testing that my COMT is, you know, both copies of that gene are bad. And so I need to support my estrogen metabolism. And one of the ways that you can do that is with cruciferous vegetables. And I noticed for me personally, like uh, before I even went keto and I just went low carb, adding in a ton of cruciferous vegetables, it just felt like the game just kept getting easier and easier and easier to the point that I got like almost too lean. I never lost my period or anything, but I got like really lean. I was like, whoa, who am I? You know, so getting that hormone thing on your side is super helpful. But that being said, like I have other clients, you know, they have gut sensitivity issues to cruciferous vegetables, right? So that might right. not be the answer for them. That's going to create more inflammation and, <laughs> and further hormone problems right so i love that we're like entering this age of like custom health right like what do you actually need so like what's working for jamie might not work for <laughs> the, the next gal you know and so that's why it's so cool that i always say keto is kind of like the gateway drug to biohacking <laughs> because it really it's is. so it's so empowering when you find out oh my gosh like i just manipulated carbohydrates out of my diet and I'm getting this benefit and this benefit and this benefit, what else can I do? <laughs> and that sounds totally. like the journey that you're on right now. <laughs> yes, absolutely. It's like this, it truly is a gateway drug because now I'm into like tracking my sleep and doing red light therapy yeah. and sauna right. therapy and like all this other cool stuff. <laughs>
Yeah, absolutely. And it complements all of that so well because you're decreasing inflammation in your body and really, truly, even on a, you know, personal development level, I've just witnessed, I've experienced it. I think you've experienced it and I've witnessed it in so many people, um, especially when I go to like ketogenic events like Metabolic Health Summit or KetoCon, which you'll be there, right? KetoCon? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm going to KetoCon. Cool. Gosh. Yeah. I can't wait to meet you in person, but the, the, the energy and the vibration amongst the people there is just so high. It's like everyone is on their uncharted, unlimited path. Like something has just been opened up and access in their brain. Like I can do anything. Right. And so I'm like, yeah. I've noticed that I'm like, we are just like a bunch of really healthy people, like really brain optimized people. And I've never experienced that in any other in any other like place that I've been, no matter what it's for, like even spiritual practices, it's just like, there's something about like a glow and a vibration of somebody who has gone into the ketogenic space. And I really think that it's because we're returning our bodies to how they're supposed to be, right? Like, right. I mean, you know, and I know, like, we're not supposed to just be stuffing our faces with food all day. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to go without, right. we're supposed to allow our bodies to um, heal themselves and to like regulate everything by going without some of those carbohydrates. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. fun, huh? And I think you brought up like a really good point, Tara. And, you know, sometimes when I'm working with clients or patients, you know, sometimes it's not that they don't know what to do. Um, some of them will even say, I know I need to cut carbs, but I love them so much. Like, it's just really hard for me. And mm -hmm. so I tell people, like, if you want to own a yacht, go hang out at the yacht club and do what those people do. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, find a friend that you really admire. Like they look and act and feel like you want to, and then just watch what they do. <laughs> because yes. when you hang out with people, those tendencies and, and actions and things like that will start to rub off on you rather quickly. So, yeah. you know, sometimes for people, it's just finding those people to hang out with. And it literally like helps you manifest in all these other areas of your life. A hundred percent. I am so all about that. And you know, what's so beautiful is like, you can actually do that through social media and podcasts, right? And the, my litmus test for a healthy person <laughs> personally is like, yes, they look healthy. They eat healthy. You know, they take care of their bodies, but, it, but are they happy? Like, do they, do they come across as like, they really genuinely care about people that they, you know, they've kind of suppressed their ego a little bit. They're um, genuinely just full of love and life. I'm like, that person is, that's, I want to emulate that person. Um, and I, I look for that even in like the people that I admire from a business perspective. And so I, I personally have kind of taken and taken this on a health. Uh, I did that on my health journey, right? Like I followed people that I was like, okay. Like they've got it together. And I think all of us do this to an extent, right? And so you can actually learn vicariously from somebody on the other side of the world um, if they're willing to share their experience. And that's what you do so beautifully. And I know what's helping so many people. Like very, a lot of people got excited when I said I was interviewing you. I got a lot of uh, messages back like, yay, can't wait to hear from her, you know, <laughs> because you're sharing. And so they're learning from you and it's beautiful. Um, but also like, you know, from a business perspective, for me personally, growing my business, um, I constantly have like my hero and the, and the entrepreneur space and self-development space, people like, like Tony Robbins and Ed Milet and Andy Frisella. And I, I just have them on play in my house so that their thoughts infiltrate my thoughts and I become more like them. Right. So right, on every level, right. but awesome and awesome it's advice to just brain body connection. I mean, it's like, if yeah. your mind, like your body will just do it. Yeah. It's like programming your subconscious <laughs> yeah. seeing is believing, I guess. Yeah. Awesome. Well, is there anything else that you would like to talk about from like a medical standpoint, like being a doctor in the space? Cause it, we're having such a shift right now, or at least it feels like to me being in the health world that people are really starting to value, like, how can I fix this from the root cause? You know, like how can I turn the fire hydrant off instead of keep trying to put all these band-aids all over the fire hydrant? Um, like yeah. in the, in the OBGYN world, like, I don't know, what's your experience with that right now? What are you seeing? Yeah. So it's an interesting time to be in medicine. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still considered probably amongst some of my colleagues as like the black sheep. Like there's mm -hmm. definitely not, um, open arms acceptance of mm. ketogenic, you know, within the mm. medical community. 
And so I guess I'm really hoping that I can, you know, be a pioneer in my field. Um, it's, we're failing patients left and right with chronic disease, and we really need to do more of this personalized medicine, getting to the root cause. And, you know, for the longest time, it was really just functional medicine doctors, but there's no reason that medical doctors can't do this. And um, the problem, you know, with the research and things like that, they'll say, well, you know, how many, re how many evidence-based research studies are there on carnivore, you know, for instance, or something. The problem is, is that, when we look at the translation of like a randomized clinical trial into evidence-based medicine, meaning it gets published in a big journal and it shows up on the doctor's desk and, and they read it and believe it and start implementing it in their practice. Um, with social media, it's, it's getting faster, but traditionally that could take up to 17 years for some of yeah. the recommendations to like trickle down. And I mean, my medical career will be over if I wait, mm -hmm. you know, for right. CTs to come out. And I just don't know how you can deny results. And so, right. you know, that's been the coolest part is that, you know, even like some of the partners in my own practice, when I first started kind of living this way and, and working with patients this way, they, they, you know, kind of like looked at me with the side eye. But when they saw that I had patients getting off blood pressure medications and reversing diabetes and like losing large amounts of weight and just feeling so great, I mean, it's hard to deny those things. Right. So, you know, if you don't have a medical provider that's supportive of your lifestyle, um, you know, there are some out there. So look around and it's just, we need, we need to be better in medicine and we, we need multimodal approaches. Um, you know, we are really putting band-aids on bullet holes. We're just throwing medications at people that come with lots of side effects. And even in the OBGYN world, I find, you know, for instance, polycystic ovarian syndrome, one of the, the first line therapies for a PCOS patient that doesn't want to get pregnant is to just put them on birth control. And the problem is, is that is one of the the greatest examples of putting a bandaid on a bullet hole because, um, you know, yes, it will increase their sex hormone binding globulin. It might bind up some of their, their free testosterone. It may help with some of their androgenic symptoms. Of course it will quote unquote return their period, but it's just like a fake withdrawal bleed. Mm -hmm. But then they come off the birth control pill and they want to get pregnant and they're at the same place or even in a worse place, you know, as far as infertility and, and their ability to achieve a healthy pregnancy. So for yes, me, please, can you dive like, into that too? Like the birth control pill, <laughs> so you can yeah. finish there, but let's dive into that so, for sure. Well, let's talk about it now. So, um, okay. so uh, let's make one thing clear. Birth control definitely has a place in women's health. Um, women, you know, who don't want a pregnancy, um, you know, sometimes a birth control pill is the right option for that patient. It's such an individual decision on, mm -hmm. on contraception. And so if you're going to be on a birth control pill, what you need to understand is that it can have other side effects and implications for your health. For instance, the birth control pill depletes the body of B vitamins and minerals like zinc, selenium, and magnesium. And so if you're going to be on a birth control pill, I recommend recommend you being on, you know, some additional supplementation in those activated forms. Um, there's a pill out there called the other pill, which I'm starting to use in my practice. And, um, but the problem is, is that for a lot of, you know, GYN complaints, we use birth control pills as a treatment, but they're, they're literally just masking the symptoms. They're not fixing the mm -hmm. reason why you're, why you have those symptoms in the first place. And so, if you're going on the birth control pill just to fix those symptoms, you know, the birth control pill essentially is for contraception. <laughs> if you have symptoms like heavy periods or, you know, cycle dysregulation um, and you don't need contraception, then you need to look at other lifestyle modifications that can help fix those problems because that is what is best for your long-term health. You know, if you have estrogen dominance, like polyps or fibroids or things like that, um, you know, correcting your estrogen dominance will correct a lot of those symptoms. Um, other, you know, birth control methods. So pills, patches and rings all work the same way. So um, they can all cause some of the same you know, side effects and problems. Um, when we look at things like intrauterine devices, so there's the progesterone IUD and the copper IUD. 
Um, the copper IUD is non-hormonal, so that's a, a good substitute if you're wishing to have contraception and avoid hormones. Um, but copper can also compete for zinc in the body, so you have to make sure that you're, you know, watching that ratio as well. Um, so it, it's such an individualized, you know, um, choice, you know, to have mm. contraception. Um, but right. certainly in women's health, we were never... Like when I was trained, like I never knew the implications of being on a birth control pill. You know, I thought it was a great treatment for a lot of things. And it really wasn't until I dove into like integrative medicine and things like that, that I realized, you know, some of the implications. And so people just need to be aware of those things and, and work with your provider individually on those. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough call for a lot of women. Cause it's like, all right, well, <laughs> you know, uh, I think you hit, like I was, <laughs> you were talking, I was like mic drop because I think everybody kind of comes in and they're like, just give me something easy to do to solve my problems instead of me having to change my habits and maybe stop eating so much sugar and all these things, right? Like make my periods better. Um, but I don't want to do anything. Just give me a pill. Right. And that's, that's like the mentality that we've been in probably, what would you say? Like the last 50 years, um, yeah. of medicine or so. So I, I'm, I'm super excited to see that shifting. And I, it, I guess my question for you is like, do you see that in your patients? Do you see a greater willingness maybe in the last, you know, five years or so for people to do lifestyle interventions to handle these problems? Or is it still kind of that mentality of like, just give me a prescription to make it better? Yeah. You, well, I may be a little bit biased because I think that I probably attract a lot yeah. of patients that That's is true. very like natural driven, you know, yeah. and wants to do these things. But, you know, I do, I do find that there are a lot of patients that are, if they understand that connection, they're more willing to try. Um, a lot of patients just don't yeah. understand the implications, you know, when they come right. in with X, Y, Z complaint and you're like, Hey, have you ever thought that maybe the way you eat could be making you feel this way? You know, until you make that right. connection for them, some of them are like, Oh, okay. I have more control over this. Like for instance, yeah. I thought I was just destined to have diabetes. I'm like, it's just in my genes. It's just going to happen no matter what, you mm -hmm. know, I'm eating 50 to 60% carbs. That's what, you know, the food and drug administration told me to eat <laughs> or the USDA. Mm -hmm. um, but people need to understand that your genes are not your destiny. So we have the ability to like turn genes on and off and we have the ability to correct insulin resistance through dietary modification. So when you make that connection for people, they just seem to be more willing to try. I get it. It's hard. They're not all going to be successful, but you need somebody that's at least giving them that as an option. You know, I have some patients that are like, listen, doc, I'm not cutting carbs. And I'm like, okay, all right, well, then let's do this because this is going to be the best thing for your health. So mm. it's a tool. It's it's one tool and it's one piece of the puzzle. And in my practice, we talk about the other tools too, like sleep and stress reduction. They're all pieces of the pie, pieces of the puzzle. Like for instance, I don't care how optimized your diet is, but if your cortisol is like through the roof, you will never see the results that you want to see. So we need to understand that nutrition is just one little piece of that pie, um, you know, and things that can optimize people's health, but it's, it's worth it, you know, to use it as a first line approach. Mm, I love it. And honestly, like, thank you. Thank you. Because I get anytime I find a doctor, especially one, you know, that's actually practicing, um, has patients coming and they're giving like they've taken the time to understand the nutritional approach and they're giving that advice. It's so powerful because we are so like doctors really like hold so much power. Like, you know, people walk in there, they're like, I'll do whatever you say. Like, I have no idea <laughs> how to fix this. Mm -hmm. So when you take that moment and say, Hey, did you know that you could actually completely correct this at the root with the, with diet that's very very powerful like you hold that uh credibility already and for me as like 
a health coach, it's so nice because like a lot of my patients or clients, I have to work with their doctors and make sure we're like on the same page. And when they're already familiar and on board with ketogenic dieting, it's just so beautiful for the client and patient from their perspective. It's like, okay, I'm in good hands here. Everyone understands what's happening. Um, like all the, there's no fight in between. So like, good on you. Thank you <laughs> for, for like being the black sheep. <laughs> Thank you so much. We need more. If you're yeah. a provider out there listening. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. And Come I love the dark side. <laughs> yeah. And I have, I've heard several stories of doctors, you know, uh, paying attention when their clients start getting those results. So we, you know, as patients really hold a lot of power in our hands too, to, be instruments for change in the world just by leading by example, right? And showing our doctors like, okay, well, all my blood markers are getting better and I lost weight and I feel amazing, <laughs> right? So, right. yeah, right. So we're all part of this like huge change, I feel like, in the shift of like human he or healthcare, at least in the United States, for sure. Like with this shift is so needed, obviously. Like if you look at the obesity and diabetes and metabolic syndrome trends, it's just like, insane. It's, uh, there was a doctor speaking at metabolic health summit and I just love her and I can't remember her name. I got to find out, but <laughs> she was on stage just going, why are we not freaking out? <laughs> like we should, like if this was like some disease or bird flu or something, and we saw the trends going up like this, like people would be freaking out. Right. <laughs> but right, right. <laughs> because our donuts and our hamburgers and fries are attached to it, we're like, eh, take my chances. Well, it like, <laughs> It reminds me, I think you even posted this one time, Tara, but there's this like name out there that's like, I ate meat for 30 days and everyone freaked out, but like nobody freaked yeah. out when I was eating a dozen donuts. Like <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Now they're all afraid I'm going to die. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. All right. So Dr. Fit and Fabulous guys on Instagram, it's doctor is written out. And then is that the best way to find you, Jamie? Yes, I'm on Instagram and Facebook, Dr. Fit and Fabulous. I also cool. have a website, drfitandfabulous.com, doctor spelled out D O C T O R. Um, and that's the best way to get a hold of me or contact me. I'll be at KetoCon. So if any of you are going, I would love to meet you. And I will be at Metabolic Health Summit too. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, KetoCon is in the end of June in um, Austin, Texas. And um, yeah, guys, go follow her for sure. She's super, super fun. You're super fun to follow and very, very inspiring and lots of great information. I think it's so beautiful that your path took you on exercise science and nutrition into being an OBGYN because now you're just this powerful force combined with your own personal story for really, especially women helping us optimize our health. So it's really cool to watch you like just blossom in your journey and like make such a huge impact on the world. So thanks for being awesome. <laughs> you're so sweet. Thanks for having me, Tara. All right. Bye.